of millions of people. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do you yeah. guys archive these, or are they only live stream? They are in perpetuity. Okay, so we're live. We're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Poison Pen event. My name is uh, Patrick. I'm the science fiction fantasy selector here at the store. And today, I've got a real treat. Um, I have Jane Linskold, an author of umpteen series. But today, she's currently here for um, the Otherware series and for the Star Kingdom series, um, co-written with David Weber, which yes. is really cool. So um, the Overware series is published by Bain, as is the um, Star Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And But you've been writing for quite a while now. You're yep. one of the mavens of oh science fiction and fantasy. I've hit that point. I'm a maven. <laughs> That's so pathetic. <laughs> um, yeah, I my first published short story came out, let me see, in, I was still living in Virginia, so early 90s, late 80s. Exactly. And yeah. I've been pretty much a full-time writer since uh, middle 1994. I think I've been reading you since then as well. So I've been a long time You must time have reader. just been hatched. <laughs> I was a teenager, you mm -hmm. know, so it was good. And uh, fortunately, the, the library that I went to always had your books uh, very prominently displayed. Oh, good. I think you had some um, uh, real enthusiasts there at the library. Which Where is, were you living? Um, Littleton, Colorado, Okay. enough. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And then we came down here and... Um, uh, a former employee of the store and uh, librarian friend Patricia mm -hmm. actually um, introduced me to your Firekeeper Saga ah, series. Yes. So I, that was one of her favorite series and is one of the longest running series in kind of fantasy. You've been writing these since 1998 and you're still continuing with the series. Yes, I did uh, two relatively recently, Wolf Search and Wolf Soul. Um, which pick up pretty hard on the heels of Wolf's Blood, but I needed some time to think about what the characters were doing. Uh, I, never, I never wanted to fall into the series I loved and that readers were invested into, well, this is just a filler book that we're going to put in for the moment. I really always wanted it to be something I was very enthusiastic about. And I realized that for those books, what needed to change is for a long time we'd had things from Firekeepers. What Firekeeper was doing and Firekeeper's incentive, this time Firekeeper needed to step back and Blind Seer needed to resolve some of his issues mm -hmm. because he had had a whole lot of things building. Blind Seer's a wolf. Um, and he had had a whole lot of things going on for him in the course of uh, following around his, his human childhood best friend. And I realized that what the series needed in order to refresh and proper was we needed to focus in and give him priority. It must have been a lot of fun coming back to old characters, mm -hmm. people that you really know. I mean, oh, they yeah. live now, basically, yeah. within your head. And they live in a lot of people's heads, which is something that I feel really strongly about, is that there comes a point in which the characters belong to you, but they also belong to the readers, and to an extent, you can't write what the readers want, because actually what the readers want is often not what they think they want. Right. You, but you need to be faithful to their passion for the series and not, not sell them short. I always think that fan fiction is what the readers want, mm -hmm. not really what they want, but what, the, what they think they want. Right. And they can write those, right? right? They can go off and do their own personal right. stories and take the characters where they want, hopefully not in a illegal way, but you know, for their own personal use. Mm -hmm. um, but to continue on with with keeping the characters fresh and keeping them new, mm -hmm. uh, you certainly did that within Wolf Soul. I thought that that was a marvelous, thank you, marvelous book. Um, in terms of that, I mean, you've been working in that series since 2001. Uh -huh. What was the impetus to decide, hey, I want to create a fantasy series centered around wolves? Uh, it was a couple of different things. My editor at that time, uh, John Douglas, said, I really would like to see a series from you. And then I started making a list of motifs and things that interested me. And one of those was the feral child idea. Mm -hmm. 
And so then if you do it as, if you do a feral child series in a science fiction context, it's pretty much going to be with aliens. Mm -hmm. And that's been done very well in a variety of ways. I didn't want to retread that. So then I started thinking about, fine, fantasy, what? I loved wolves since I was a little kid. My dad worked on, uh, for the Department of the Interior on, and justice on part of the provisions to help protect wolves. Mm -hmm. um, I heard, I do not remember saying this, but I have heard that there was a point at which he, uh, you know, we came back from business trip and I looked at him and I said, Dad, well, if nobody wants the wolves, I'll take them. <laughs> so it was fascinating together some of my passions. Mm -hmm. But I think that the feral, the first contact story aspect of a feral child raised by wolves had been done very well by the Jungle Book. Right. Or by um, Burroughs with Tarzan, except in that case it was apes. So I knew the story needed to carry beyond being just a feral child meeting humans for the first time. So I combined it with dynastic politics, which it turns out wolves are really good at because they, really they understand hierarchy. And it blossomed from there. It was interesting because I was, I was reading an article and they were talking about the wolf population and they said uh, they had taken this, this um, news reporter and mm -hmm. uh, our journalist and they were trying to figure out who the alpha was. And they said, who is the alpha? And, and the, the park ranger pointed out, well, it's the one that's sleeping because it's, it's confident enough right. in and of itself not to have to yeah. worry about what's going on around it. Yeah, yeah. So we could come back to the wolves, but... Exactly. It's, it's, it, they're fasting. It's really a fasting uh -huh. series. Now, really, we're specifically here, though, for Overware and, and the Star Kingdom. Right. Um, now, Overware, um, Library of the, Sastra, of the Sapphire, Sapphire Wind, Wind and the Aurora Borealis Bridge are essentially, two, well, they're the two link stories following three women, uh -huh. Meg, Tessa, or Teg, right. as her nickname, and Peg. Right. There we go. I got, yes. I got all three without, because sometimes I repeat them when I, <laughs> <laughs> like, anyways, um, they world slip into uh, essentially this, this um, world in which the inhabitants are anthropomorphized um, Creatures, uh -huh. so all within the natural world, what we would see as a fox, what we would see as a, a deer or a lion or a bear, they're all very much, uh -huh. um, you know, standing on very two legs. Very anthropic characters. Very anthropic, right. exactly. I can never say that word, so well, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> um, anyways, so and they're they're um, coming in as essentially uh, a magic spell brings them in. Uh -huh. They're in their book club. And maybe you can kind of go from there and give us a little bit of a spin on what the series is all about. Oh, boy. Well, you know, Charles DeLint once said, I, I'm always terrible at doing that because I used as many words as I needed to tell it when I wrote the book. Exactly. Uh, but I'll try the short version. Basically, mm -hmm. it's the story of what happens when these three women of a certain age, they're not young, which I really, for me, that was really important because so many of what he's calling world slip I call portal fantasy books focus on kids. And even mm -hmm. when I was a kid, it really bothered me. Why would, if a world was in serious trouble, them, they summon a bunch of usually not even high school age, sometimes maybe high school age mm -hmm. kids to solve their problems. And uh, a few years ago, uh, a well-deserved, multiple award-winning book was Sean and McGuire's Doorways of the Heart, which addressed another of my questions about what happened to people who go off to other worlds, which is, you're that kid who went off to another world and helped save it when you were, say, 10 years old. What do you do with the rest of your life? Especially if you've been ripped out of the world that you felt most at home in. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, Sean has done a great job of addressing one of my questions. Why don't I write the book? to address the other. So in a, in a strong sense, it started out as an idea. 
what would happen if the portal fantasy was happening to adults, mm -hmm. and not young adults, but uh, you know, Tessa Teg is the youngest of the three, and she's a mid, you know, a somewhere in her fifties college professor right. on on sabbatical. Um, the other two are older. Uh, Peg is 60-something and won't tell what. Right. Um, and uh, Meg is a 70-something-year-old retired librarian. And so I, that was interesting. It was a big challenge. How do you take adult people out of their life and all the connections of their lives and toss them into another world without issues? Um, another thing I really wanted to address is I wanted them to be volunteers, not draftees. I did not want this to be uh, Dorothy perpetually going, I want to go home, I want to go home, wine, wine, bitch, bitch. Um, so they get the chance to make the choice. They're summoned there by three young people, who each of whom have a problem that they're not necessarily comfortable talking about, but that's keeping them from moving forward in their lives. Right. And when they, Meg, Peg, and Teg hear about this, they feel a degree of sympathy. They, as Meg puts it, I've spent most of my life answering, can I help you? You know, I need help finding. Right. And so they sign on as volunteers to help these three young people find the solutions to their problems. And Library of the Sapphire Wind starts out with the uh, getting there, meeting people, doing things. And when they come through the portal, Teg who had been reading out loud at the book club is reciting this verse. And the verse contains things, these and all you will find when you pass through the doorways of the Library of the Sapphire Wind. The only problem is the Library of the Sapphire Wind was rather catastrophically destroyed, or so everyone believes, 25 years before. So they've got to find the library and find out if there are doorways that they can go through in order to even begin. So the first book, Library of the Sapphire Wind, focuses on finding the library, what they find when they get to the library, discovering that it's not chance that they're directed to the library, and moving on through there. Um, and with, really, the, it's, uh, the Aurora Borealis Bridge is a continuation almost yes. immediately from yes. book one. So the spoiler ahead, if we, if we give too much away, of right. book two. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't want to do that because I hate when people give me spoilers. I really liked the fact that you broke this up into two books, even though it's really, really one story, part one of, complete story. Yeah, part of that was the considerations of the current marketplace. Um, the days of the doorstop fantasy are currently in abeyance. Uh, people want a book that they can feel they can sit down and read comfortably without needing back support or mm -hmm. teeny tiny print. So um, when my initial draft of Library of the Sapphire Wind was 150,000 words, and that was already pushing the edges. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time right now, publishers want about 100,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I had finished my second pass through and expanded it further, then you know, filling in gaps and cleaning up my prose and stuff, it was definitely too long to be just one book. So it had to be right. broken into. You know, they did that for Jim Butcher's uh, latest series as well, where it mm -hmm. was just, they felt like it was a little too long, so they cut it down the middle. Yeah. And then they published it within two parts within a short amount of yes. time, which is what they did with yours yes. as well. Yeah, the uh, first one came out in February and the second one came out in April. So people didn't have to wait a, a terrible amount of time. I really like that, and it's, I think it's a smart approach to your publisher for doing that as well, because I do, I feel better as a reader being able to go through and read a fantasy. As a selector, I go through a lot of fantasy books, and it's hard for me to read a full thousand pages of a book to get a really good feel for what's yeah. out there. So I, by breaking into two... Yeah, one of the things that um, I've been happy about these books is that um, if you notice the cover art is one painting, which I think is kind of cool. Um, 
is that the number of people who have been sending me fan mail or posting on my social media, things like, I've been rationing myself to one chapter a day mm -hmm. because I'm loving this so much I don't want it to be over. So that's a, that's a really good feeling. It's really refreshing within Library of the Sapphire when to have adults going through and they're rationally thinking of what's going on and what's happening. Mm -hmm. You're not having uh, this sort of henny penny sort of moments from your characters. They're like, yeah, we're here. Mm -hmm. Welcome to reality. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. If, if we're, you know, beyond the defiance of our senses, we've got three adults here. Uh, it's much easier to just accept, yep, this is really happening. Exactly. And then they do have the option. Um, without really spoiling much, to go back home, make preparations, yes. and then come on back mm -hmm. to help them. Uh, like help. I said, I didn't want draftees. Right. I did. So, so in terms of that, I mean, were you thinking to yourself, okay, um, we've got Peg, who's mm -hmm. been a mother of several people. Lots. Uh, lots of children. Of course, Meg, who is the librarian, uh -huh. used to helping people and helping them find their uh -huh. their way. And then you've got Teg, who is the art archaeologist, who is so good at uh, finding what was lost uh -huh. and doing the research and uh -huh. getting an idea. Was there a, an image in your mind of creating these three matriarchs, and specifically three matriarchs? Which you know we've got the weird sisters things like that where it's kind oh, of oh yeah you've got to do within, three you've yeah. got to do three that was definitely part of it um, another thing was um, I wanted I wanted all people I wanted people who came from a very wide range of the skill sets available to women today mm -hmm. I didn't. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being a mom. Right. There's, you know, I chose the professional path. I mean, I've, I'm a college, I was a college professor before I wrote full time. But that doesn't mean I disdain people who have chosen to devote themselves to putting a lot of energy into raising kids. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's a hugely multifaceted job. So I definitely wanted Peg in there to make it clear that hey, you're, you chose to be a mom, that doesn't mean you're a second-class citizen. Right. And, Pe and Meg, the librarian, sort of reflects the time period when women's choices professionally were pretty much limited to teacher, librarian, nurse, mm -hmm. um, you, maybe secretary. You, know, you didn't really have that many options. So I wanted someone who had prospered and developed a whole lot within what had once been the only traditional limitation. So I was definitely looking to shout out for the people who the people who broke open the world without denying the women who are still doing a great job raising kids. Right. Um, I think it's it's very easy to forget how recent the professional woman is in most most areas. I mean I know so many women who are in their, even in their, just still in their late 60s, who were the first or the second mm -hmm. to graduate with a degree in whatever they graduated in from their specific colleges. So it's, when I was, when I was doing these women, I wanted to reflect the generations they were coming out of. Exactly. Yeah. And the fact that they have it and then they're great, and they get out there, and they, yeah. you know, kick butt and take names, and deal with monsters, and deal with chaotic young people who are are up to their ears in emotional angst, angst, <laughs> and, and problems. And one of the things I would, like I said, I was a college professor, and one of the things I ran into and really enjoyed as a college professor was that age group, the late teens through early twenties, where the people involved are, on some levels, so smart, mm -hmm. so skilled, so sophisticated, and on the other hand, something that to you or I might seem a very routine task has them completely floored. Right. And so the, the 
early, late teens to early 20s is a mind I spent a lot of time in because I taught, taught English composition. I have read literally thousands of essays by people in that age group and can appreciate that it's great. So this isn't a book about adults helping kids or kids stepping in to save the world. It's a group about adults of various ages and experience sets stepping in all together right. to deal with things. But they're more and it's the fun. They're but, the teachers, they're the mentors, right. which is what I really like. Yes. They can get in there and they do some of the action, but then they also um, are guiding. Yeah. They're in a way almost parenting, but not quite. Right. They're mentoring. Mentoring is, and, yeah. And it's, it's important to remember the origin of the word mentor comes from the false name that Athena gave Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, when she, he was looking for his father. In other words, they're stepping in to be that little bit of wisdom that youth needs to move forward. Exactly. And the characters grow. Your young characters grow an awful lot from the beginning to the end on mm -hmm. this great adventure. Yeah, well, they get a pretty big shock uh, in the first about quarter of the first book. And and we aren't going to spoil her that one, but but I think that that forces them to really reassess a lot of things about their lives. Now, in terms of world building, what made you decide to do port? We talked a little bit about portal fantasy and your idea of wanting to try to answer one of the questions that you've always had about portal fantasy. Now, my question to you is when you were building that world and creating that world and creating what happened, what did you do in terms of creating it? Did you outline the whole thing? Are you a pantser? I'm, I'm, I'm a very intuitive plotter. Okay. I hate the term pantser. It's such an ugly word. Um, but I'm, I'm very much an intuitive plotter. But any time you put in one thing, you need to put in other things. You know, for example, uh, the minute you have somebody swinging a, seal, a steel sword, you are assuming a tech level that allows people to forge steel. Right. So any decision you make is going to shape every other decision. You start out with any possibility, but the minute you make one decision, you make another. Mm -hmm. um, for this world, since when I did the Firekeeper books, I had done a very low magic world. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, magic is somewhat anathema in large chunks of that world. I really wanted an opportunity to do a pull out all the stoppers, you know, high, fa high fantasy, high magic mm -hmm. world because I hadn't done that before. I'd always, except for a few short stories, I'd always really deliberately held myself back from doing that. So it seemed like it was time. What was some of your favorite things that you were able to do with magic within this world? Flying ships. Flying ships. Flying ships. <laughs> Flying ships was lots of fun, um, and but that again was in part a solution to a story problem. If I was going to have three characters, the youngest of whom was in her fifties, um, the idea of spending days on end on horseback was just untenable. Exactly. Or the equivalent of horseback, which in this case would probably be I don't know a Kubrin. Um, so I decided we needed the equivalent of of a comfortable, interesting mobile transport, and a flying ship seemed like a good idea. Uh, and it, you know, it's a great place because it's it's a home base in uh -huh. a way. I mean, you got the ship, yeah, of course. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, they're. I was just thinking, you wouldn't want the Lord of the Rings walking simulator, you know, either for them. I mean, you want to get them to point A and to point B. Yeah. And you don't want to write 150 pages about them getting from yeah. point A to point B as well. Well, it's funny you mentioned Lord of the Rings. Jim and I were re-listening to it on the drive out here. And they do a lot of walking and then going, oh, we can't go that way, and turning and walking a different <laughs> direction and going, oh, the monster ate the wizard, and we're going to walk a different direction, except this time I think we're going to run for a while. Um, you know, currently we're at the point in the two towers where they're running across the landscape. Yeah, I, I really didn't feel like writing a book where I had to constantly be, go, have Meg go, excuse me, I'm in my 70s, you know, 
I'm in great shape for in my 70s, but I've kind of hit my limit on hiking for today. <laughs> so exactly. having the slice wind for them to, to ride um, both solved that thing. Plus it was just cool. Yeah. Thinking about how would a flying ship work? Um, and you know, it uses wind, but since it doesn't have hull resistance from water drag or mm -hmm. algae or barnacles or any of those cool things, mm -hmm. um, they have a certain greater capacity for speed, but it still can restrict things. Anyhow, it was fun. That was probably my favorite. I also like that one of my young, uh, younger characters, Zerak, is a wizard, yes. um, complete with a staff. And and you wouldn't think Zerak was a wizard because he's the lion. Right. So immediately you're expecting him to be the more physical. Yes, but no, he's, no, that's, that's, that's Grunwald the, the stag. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you turn some things in our head. You, you make us think a little bit. You make us stop and take pause of what our, maybe what our traditional beliefs would be. Right. Um, in terms of creating your characters, I mean, um, do you take advantage of anything like, uh, um, oh gosh, what would be the best way to describe it? Using um, kind of the hero's pathway that Joseph Campbell no. talks about? Campbell, Campbell's very Jungian and, uh, and, and, and really kind of forces stuff into, into preconceived notions. Um, I, I, I don't buy it. Gotcha. Um, I am. I actually have a fairly extensive background in folklore and mythology, um, and for everything that you can hammer into Camel's hero's pathway, there are a whole lot of exceptions. Um, he he hammered hard to make it <laughs> fit his thesis. Um, I'm much more likely to think about how people would really react to things mm -hmm. and, and go that way. Yeah. And people are full of contradictions, so that's, that happens too. What I really love about this book is you really get into your characters' heads. Mm -hmm. You really get them thinking and giving us their point of view, especially Tag, of course. Right, Tag's she's, the point of view character. She's so. the point of view. Um, are there people that you pulled from that you thought of to kind of give you Tag as a whole? No, no. I never, my, my characters become very real mm -hmm. to me. Um, Tag, I had as a resource for Tag as an archeologist, the fact that I'm married to an archeologist there. Um, so I had a very good resource mm -hmm. for how an archeologist thinks, what an archeologist's skill sets really are, which you know does not normally come commonly include uh, fedoras and bullwhips. True. Um, I know. He's got a fedora. Um, but the, uh, but no, they're, they're themselves, not uh, lightly mm -hmm. shave off the serial numbers, uh, people I know. Right. They're real people. They become very real in my own head. Now, you're simultaneously writing this book as you're also writing um, The Star Kingdom with David Weber. Sort of, yes. Sort of. Or probably one right after the other is my guess. It kind of went like this. All right, you asked before we got started, how did I happen to have three books come out within six months of each other? And it's a complicated saga having to do with the realities of life. Um, back in, I think it was 2017, I finished up some projects I had. I got the idea for Library of the Sapphire Wind, and between about April and October of 2017, I wrote that 150,000 words, which for me is very, very fast. Um, it was sloppy, but it, it was a full, arc, a full story arc. Uh, it was somewhat sloppy in some things. There were places, descriptions, and stuff I left to go back to and work out later. Mm -hmm. Then Weber finally got the opening in his schedule to start working on what at that point we just called Star Kingdom 4. I have reams of notes for SK4. Um, and so, no, excuse me, there was something that came in the middle, pardon. Then in late 2017, my agent got my rights to the Firekeeper book 
it's back for me. Mm -hmm. And I had been thinking for quite a while about Wolf Search and Wolf Soul. Now that I had the rights to the series back, I had to stop. Um, I did new book, ebook editions with them, with unique to the ebook. Uh, afterwards, talking about some aspect of the series. Then I went ahead and I wrote Wolf Search and Wolf Soul. Okay. It was as I was finishing up Wolf Soul that Weber finally came out of his backlog of work, and we started work on a new clan, which involved a certain amount of brainstorming together, getting the initial plot points together. We'd done two others in the series before, um, and I had been the behind-the-scenes collaborator. The first book in the series is called A Beautiful Friendship, and it starts with 11-year-old Stephanie Harrington being the person who makes first contract with tree cats. Tree cats are differently intelligent, but in their own way as intelligent as humans, arboreal, creatures about the size of, say, uh, a large, a very large house cat. Um, there are a lot of people who think they were modeled after Maine Coons. They weren't mm -hmm. really, but gives you an idea. Um, and on the planet Sphinx, the tree cats are the indigenous, mm -hmm. intelligent creature. In A Beautiful Friendship, 11-year-old Stephanie Harrington is the first person to meet a tree cat. I won't go into all of that. The second part of the book jumps several years, and then when Weber and I started working together on, I was backstage for all of these. I read the manuscript before it came out. I gave him advice, etc. cetera. Um, then we wrote uh, Fire Season, which takes place when Stephanie is 14 going on 15. Uh, and deals with the consequences of a major, a major drought and fire season on the planet Sphinx, which is heavily, uh, heavily forested. And since the tree cats are arboreal, the impact on them mm -hmm. is, is fairly huge. Then the third book we did together was the, called Tree Cat Wars and is split between Stephanie and her good friend Carl going off to the main planet in the system for advanced training, while back at home, the tree cats are falling apart because there's been so much habitat destruction that it's forcing them into conflict with each other. And Stephanie's uh, best friend and boyfriend are left behind to try and deal with the problem of the tree cats are losing it and having some major problems. And then Stephanie and Carl come back and, and that is resolved. So when we got to a new clan, I said to Weber, I'd really like to do a book in which the tree cats aren't in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because I felt we had really done a lot of the tree cats are in trouble in A Beautiful Friendship, part two, there's somebody who's trying to poach and kidnap the tree cats. In Fire Season, somebody is trying to burn up, you know, the world is trying to burn up the tree cats. I said, I think, I think both us and the readers and the tree cats need a break from something <laughs> horrible is about to happen to the tree cats. So, as you said, it's more a mystery story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Weber feels strongly about, and I agree with, is that there's a problem in YA where all the adults are completely stupid. Right. And I'm sorry, Honor Harrington is not a stupid character. Right. And you it's couldn't you couldn't put her in that role. Well, I this mean, isn't Honor. This is Stephanie, who is right. her her great great several generations back grandmother. Right. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the, the Star Kingdom books are prequels by by multiple generations. Um. So Stephanie is, so what Weber felt very strongly is he wanted to write young adults where, the, yes, the young people were on deck and solving the problems, but not because the adults were too stupid. Mm -hmm. But this does make it hard to come up with plots in which the young people have agency and need to have agency 
where the reader is not going to be left with the question of, well, why aren't the authorities taking over? Right. So in this particular book, one of the central plot elements is built around the question of some, there has been a massive um, uptick of accidents among young people and people in general. And why? Is it just coincidence or is it not? And s even when there becomes a suspicion that there is a new drug being, right. being distributed, it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. So the law enforcement can't step in because it's not illegal. Right. So it gave us a chance to do a book in which our young people were on deck. And the tree cats are tele-empaths. That is, they can't read thoughts, but they read emotions. And so that's a great advantage for Stephanie and for I'm around the outer edge because they've got a camera in the middle here. Um, so, so it's a great advantage for them in that the tree cats can be very sensitive to the emotions of people, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage right. um, because they, they don't take well, and there's a lot going on um, in here, so. There is a lot going on, and, but it must be fun. So what, we get quite a few authors who work together in collaboration. Douglas Preston, Lincoln Child. Sure. Um, Clive Kessler for a long time. James Patterson has uh -huh. talked about the collaboration process. Uh -huh. For you and David, what's the collaboration process look like for you? It shifts from book to book. Um, it, it shifts from book to book. The honor verse is his playground. Um, but despite the fact that he writes a lot of military science fiction and fantasy and people believe that he has massive tomes of resource material, mm -hmm. the fact is most of it's between his ears. Yeah. So um, this can cause some, some difficulties for a collaborator because I need to be able to ask him, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what will what will X be and what will Y be and how do we keep it in keeping with the world? So he is one of his biggest roles in these books is he's the Bible. He is right. the resource base because he really has worked a lot of these things out. It's there between his ears. He just needs the right question to get it coming forward. Right. However, one of my jobs is to hold him to continuity. Um, yeah, I hear a laugh from there. It sounds like somebody was caught Weber out on a continuity error. Um, and uh, so in terms of drafting, we both definitely write some of the prose. In A New Clan, in fact, uh, the opening piece uh, comes completely from a novella he wrote that I just he sent to me, and I just loved it, after I pointed out to him that he had a continuity issue. Um, you know. But, um, but that was fixable. Um, but I thought, it was, I thought it was really moving and really beautiful. And, and I said, I think we, you've, you've invented, oh dear Paul. Um, I said, you've got a great, a great setup here with Cordelia, with uh, Heartstone, the tree cat, who is, by tree cat terms, uh, both deaf and mute, he's lost his telepathic ability, and since they don't have any form of spoken communication, he's extremely handicapped. So, um, so I said, let's pick up with these characters and wrap them into the story and expand on what happens beyond the. And now Cordelia has a tree cat, mm -hmm. which is where where his piece ends. And, it, it, and that in itself provided some great spinning forward of the plot. The, the title, A New Clan, which we have nifty buttons for if anyone wants one, um, comes from the realization on the part of Stephanie's tree cat partner, Lionheart, also known as Climbs Quickly by tree cats, um, that uh, by now, there have been enough tree cats who have formed bonds with humans that they really have a new tree cat clan, mm -hmm. the tree cats who live with humans. Yes. And for them, that's a huge, again, these are prequels to the Honor Harringtons. This is a major point in tree cat social evolution, the realization that the relationships with humans are not going to just be a chance 
one-off Stephanie and Lionheart, it is now becoming a new part of their culture. Now, with both books, you've got a strong mystery involved within it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't think that you can do... Uh, I think it's hard. Every quest fantasy that you're going to have, every science fiction story you're going to have, usually has some element of mystery. Right. Um, but with the new clan, it's specifically, basically, at its heart, a mystery on top of being yes. a science fiction novel. For you, what was... Um, did you find that you had to change your pacing or the way that you set this up because it was is traditionally a mystery? Not really, because you've read my books mm -hmm. and you've read The Fire Keepers and right. others. On the whole, I prefer stories that are built around, every story has to have a conflict. In a romance novel, you know, it might be who gets who or, you know, who's available to marry whom or what con, but you have to have a conflict to move things forward. Mm -hmm. And the easiest conflict is, is war. Right. I don't like writing war stories. That is not something I particularly want to spend my time writing, which means at the heart of most of my novels, there's a mystery, because that's the other good conflict element to do, is we don't know why something is happening and why that something is having an impact on things. So, no, not at all, because I've essentially been writing some variation on the mystery pretty much in all of my 30-something novels, because I don't like writing war stories. Exactly. Interestingly enough, though, right now you're getting published by Bain, who is so well known. I know, I know. For military fiction, or military science fiction. I know, and that's, that's funny. Well, part of that is, um, it started with, I mean, I work with Weber, and Weber is you know, Bain, one of Bain's major, major authors. So, but the Stephanie books have never been war books. No. Um, Stephanie's long-term goal, and in fact future as outlined by him in the series, is that she will eventually become the head of the Sphinxian Forest Service, which is really hard to say fast, and um, will be the person who as an adult, finally gets Tree Cat's legal representation as co-indigenous species with rights on the planet. We're looking at the childhood of that person, the childhood and young adulthood of that person. Um, so Stephanie's story has never been about war. It's been about legalities. Mm -hmm. uh, she'll grow up and become on Sphinx, uh, forest rangers are essentially law enforcement agents. So Stephanie will grow up and be a cop. And we're seeing, so it's very natural that we have essentially cop type stories. When I, I wrote Library of the Sapphire Wind and Aurora Borealis Bridge just for myself for my own amusement, but I was enjoying working with Tony Weisskopf at Bain a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, but I really wasn't sure, as you said, they're so known for doing military, right. whether she would be interested in something that wasn't. So one of Bain's other authors, I didn't ask Weber, because he, he is the world's most eternal optimist, and I didn't want the eternal optimist's answer. Um, but one, some, a fellow I've known since I was a college undergrad, uh, currently writing for them, Charles E. Gannon, Chuck Gannon, um, I got in touch with Chuck, and I said, you know, you've been working with Bain for a couple of years, good number of years now. Do you think Tony might be interested in something that isn't military science fiction? And he said, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I think she wishes she got more. Mm -hmm. um, she loves her, you know, she loves her military science fiction, but that doesn't mean she isn't interested. And then I went and looked at their more recent uh, publishing, and I realized it was there. Uh, yeah. Tim Powers' last couple of books, Alternate Routes and I, Stolen Skies, were both out of Bain. Yeah. Um, and several other authors. So. Yeah, oddly I, enough, one of our top selling urban fantasy books, The Jupiter Man, uh -huh. this year came out in paperback, and it's just been, it's been doing really well here. So uh, they've been publishing, and they're getting 
more known for more than just just military just military yeah. fiction. So I I had a wonderful experience with this. I I had a I wrote up a proposal. I sent it to Tony along with the um, I think with the manuscript, mm -hmm. and she got back to me within less than a month. Wanted wanted both books mm -hmm. and already had them on her schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, if I was going to take them, she said, I want to bring them out early next year, uh, two months apart. Uh, what do you think about Tom Kidd for the cover art? And it's like, I said to Jim, I said, I haven't seen this much just raw enthusiasm in a long time. Yeah. I'm, I'm willing to take the gamble. Yeah. And I very much enjoyed it. They've, done, they've been really easy to work with. It's been really a lot of fun. You've got yeah. a great publicist, and uh, it's been fun working with a publisher. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you're also really well known for short stories. Yeah, I've got a few. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, for you, what do you prefer writing, the short form or the long form? I like both because they let me tackle different things. Um, I like novels because I like the detail and the immersion. I like living a long time with people, but there are certain ideas that work best just dealt with in a short form. And I've found that for me, my ideal length tends to be between uh, about seven and 8,000 words. Yeah. For some reason, that's, I just come into there. For those of you who don't do, do publishing, that's between about 28 and 30 manuscript pages. Um, the old way it was estimated before computers counted things was 250 words a page. Um, so it's more what the idea would be. Yeah. Um, and Bain commissioned me when these books would be coming out to write for their website a short story set in this universe. And since we didn't want any spoilers, I wrote a prequel. And it's called Fire Bright Rain. And it deals with the day the Library of the Sapphire Wind is destroyed. And you know that couldn't have been a story that went on for a whole novel. No. And really the aftermath wouldn't have made a very good novel, but that little chunk in time where everything goes wrong and pretty catastrophically wrong, mm -hmm. and how do people get out, those who get out, get out, made a really good, very punchy short story. For, I look at you and I look at your bibliography and it clearly shows you're one of the hardest working writers in the business in terms oh of my. you publish a lot and you write a lot. Okay. Um, I, I know a few friends about who, who would think I'm, I'm a piker compared to them, <laughs> but okay. I know there's always uh, those other people that we compare ourselves to, right? Yeah. What is it for the new generation if they're interested in writing fantasy or they're writing military science fiction? Because you've done, you've done it all. Uh, yeah. Um, I have done military, despite the fact that I don't like writing war. I have, yeah. I have written mine. Um, what would you recommend to them in terms of writing? What is your, what is your mentorly advice to the, the, oh boy. the new generation? Write. Don't dream about writing. Think about the story. Don't think about how great it would be to be an author. Right. You know, think about you want to be a writer. You don't want to be an author. Right. Being an author is not a job description. It's the willingness to write. Find what your pace is. And the thing is that there is no one ideal way for a writer to write, but there is an ideal way for every writer to write. Uh, Walter John Williams is a good friend of mine, lives in New Mexico. One point, we were having dinner with a friend, and the friend started asking us questions about our work days. And she finally stopped after about five questions and said, OK, if I have this straight, there is never going to be the same time of day that Walter and Jane are writing. And Walter and I looked at each other and nodded. Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> but both of us manage right. to write consistently and efficiently and well. So I think you need to find your own place your own pacing, your own discipline. In my case, um, I treat it like a job. Mm -hmm. I write five days a week, uh, Monday to Friday, 
even on a weekend like this, where effectively part of it's a working weekend. Right. When I'm back in my home, I will pick up a routine, a routine mm -hmm. work work week day the next day. Um, uh, I take weekends off because otherwise you burn out. Yeah. Um, don't fall into the trap of the every so often you're going to run into writers out there who you find are writing, you know, they, they brag about their binges, 10,000 words in a day. Take a look at those people, look for them five years later. Most of them will have burned out. I'm seeing, I'm old enough now that I'm seeing some of the people who push themselves hardest, convention every weekend, uh, writing into the wee hours of the night, not taking care of their health. Um, they're having serious health issues. Mm -hmm. They're burning out. They're not writing as well. So I think it's if you're going to do it as a profession, you need to treat it like a job. But that means getting your exercise, watching your diet, uh, getting your sleep at night, exactly, etc. Um, people often ask me, "Well, I want to be a professional writer. What should I major in? Major in something that's going to pay your bills, because it's extremely hard to make a living as a professional writer." Uh, if you go and look at the websites of most professional writers, you will notice that many of them are teaching college or on the lecture circuit or something or another. Uh, very few uh, writers make a full-time living. If you don't want to have another job, like I don't want to have another job, learn to live with poverty. It's, it's, it's your friend um, because it, it frees you up. You can't have everything. Right. So if you choose to work a job that is going to pay erratically and at a low rate, then learn how to live on a budget, for goodness sake. It's a challenge. I've, you know, very, very few writers are going to become like Dan Brown, right? Right. Or Daniel Steele. I think those right. are two that... But at the same time, I mean, Danielle Steele still writes four books a year. Yeah, how she the, works she really do? hard. She is a hard worker, and mm -hmm. so she's... Uh, they make a lot of money by that by that point in time, but it's still it's few and far between. Yeah. So, it's I you know I I also would say take a job that doesn't involve writing. Yeah. Because most writers have only a certain amount of writing in their head, and once they finish it, if let's say you love to write and you go to work for a newspaper and you decide to become a newspaper reporter, by the end of the day of writing articles. You don't have the writer stuff in your brain to write fiction. I picked a newspaper reporter specifically because one of my best friends is a now retired newspaper reporter, mm -hmm. yeah. and and found that was the case. Much better to you know stock shelves at Walmart mm -hmm. and let your brain be free to write when you come home. And also, I think one of the things that I always feel as a bookseller mm -hmm. is that. When people ask me whatever, what are you reading that you really like, and I always I always give people mid list writers uh -huh. because mid list writers uh -huh. write better books. It's the usually usually uh -huh. I can't say that for all, but uh -huh. it's a good, and they're not given the marketing budget that. Don't get me wrong, Lee Child or right. Michael Conley, fantastic writers, fun writers. But they don't need me to promote their book. <laughs> well, yeah. I think there's something to that. But really, it, there's, no, there's no one way mm -hmm. to make it work. Right. But I think you've got to, I think anyone who wants to take on writing has to understand it really is work. Right. It's not, it, it can be a hobby activity, sure. Sure. But then you're, you're working two jobs. Exactly. And I mean, I started writing fiction when I was a full-time college professor, uh, teaching at a small college where I was not only teaching five classes, which is very unheard of for college professors, but often five preps. And I was a new professor, so I didn't have my file of lesson plans. Right. But I still made the time every day to sit down and write. And what book was it that you first came out with once you were done? Uh, Brother um, to Dragon's Companion to Alice, my nice. first novel, was written while I was a full-time college professor. Uh, so that one was the first one you wrote out of the gate, or was No, this... that was the third one I wrote out of the gate, but 
The other two were eventually published. Nice. Um, but yeah, but the first one was Brother to Dragons, Companion to Owls. Well, now is a good time to sort of open up to the audience for questions. Does anybody here happen to have a question or online? Kathy. Please. I would like there to be another Artemis book, and um, if I get a hole in my schedule and the right idea, I think it would be called Mystics of the Ice Realms. Um, but, uh, but I currently am scheduled. I'm currently writing a third book in this series called House of Rough Diamonds, and I have a two-book contract with David Weber that I have, we have to finish up. So if I do it, it will be in the future. But I would like to. I like when I re went through the, when I went through those books again when I did the new ebook editions of them recently. I really found myself interested in what the next step of the journey would be. Oh, I, I'm telling you, that. Can you wait so long? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <clears throat> Okay. Thank you. I will do so. <laughs> I think your gentleman in the corner here. Bain Books. So. The question was, who is publishing the book? And the, the, it is Bain Books. Any other online questions, Ian? Nope. All right. Nope. Well, I think this is a good chance for you to meet and greet with the audience. All right. For those of you who are online, I, I think I'm starting to lose my microphone here a little bit. You can buy the book through the Poison Pen. We're going to have signed copies. And we're going to have essentially double signed copies of the new clan. Um, David Weber has been kind enough to sign book plates for us. So if you pick up a copy of The New Clan, you also get one of the David Weber signed book plates. Uh, of course, uh, in order to continue and support the, the local authors that we have here, continue to buy your books through the Poison Pen. And uh, we're more than glad to ship you a signed copy of Jane Linskold's book. And if you give us enough time, we can even get that book personalized um, when any of the authors are coming through. Jane, thank you so much. And thank for your you, time Pat. For doing this. This has been so much fun. Let's give a big round of applause for Jane. <laughs> and uh, you can come on up and get your book signed. And uh, everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Turn you off there. That way you don't have to have private conversations that are vacant here. Right. Do you want to sign at the comfy chair, or are you more I, comfortable I, here? I, I dare say there's only going to be. I'll, I'll sit down there for the if anyone does. Oh, absolutely. All right. Do I care about the delay?